when I was young, I thought that an apple tree is an apple tree. It took me years before I realized that there are lots of different cultivars of apples, and each cultivar may produce an apple that looks very different, and they taste very different. Some are sweet and some are tart, and in my opinion, they're all very special. But even within a single cultivar, you can have very different trees. So some Macintosh apple trees will grow to be so large that you need a ladder to harvest them. And other Macintosh apple trees can be so small that even when they're mature, you can pick all the fruit on the tree by hand. So what's the difference? Why does one cultivar of apple trees come in all different sizes? Well, the answer is that the tree's size depends on the rootstock that the tree is grafted onto. So in today's program, we're going to dig, dig deep into apple tree rootstocks. And my guest on the show today is John Strang, retired extension fruit and veg vegetable specialist from the University of Kentucky. So I'm going to start chatting with John in just a moment, but first I would love to hear from you. Send in your questions, your comments, or just email us to say hello, and we will enter you into today's contest. And this month's prize is a book called The Modern Homestead Garden, Growing Self-Sufficiency in Any Size Backyard. And it's by Gary Pilarczyk, valued at $24.99. So to enter today's contest, all you have to do is send an email during the live show to instudio101 at gmail.com. That's instudio101 at gmail.com. And remember to include your first name and where you are writing from. I look forward to hearing from you soon. So now to John. John, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are going to tell us a little bit today about apple tree rootstocks. So let's start with the basic question. What are apple tree rootstocks and how are they used? Well, uh, rootstocks have been around for a long time. Uh, we've been grafting apples for and fruit trees for over 2000 years. The Greeks and Romans did that quite a bit. And originally uh, you planted a seed and you got an apple tree but you found one that you really liked and you wanted to propagate it, but you couldn't take a seed out of that apple and plant it and get that apple. It's like your children are gonna look exactly like you are and there's not a chance. So a lot of the progeny of apple trees aren't very good for eating. And so they found out that if they grafted that variety onto a rootstock, they could maintain that genetic material and get the same tasting apple that they had before. And over time, uh, astute nurserymen and growers noticed that some trees were a little smaller than others, and they realized that they could graft these varieties onto dwarfing rootstocks. And the, they originally, in 1472, uh, they talked in the literature about a paradise rootstock. And in the 1800s, uh, European growers selected paradise rootstocks. There were two general types. There was the uh, French paradise or also called paradise rootstock that was a smaller rootstock. And then there was the Duchenne or English paradise that was a little larger rootstock. And of course, you know, if you're a nursery guy, you don't stick with one nursery. So you'd go to different nurseries and the paradise rootstock in one nursery would give you a different size tree than the one in another nursery. So if you're an apple grower, you want consistency in your tree sizes. And so uh, uh, Sir Ronald Hatton at the East Malling Station in Kent, England, in about 1913, started collecting rootstocks from all over Europe. He collected them from the Netherlands and of course UK and France and Germany. And then they evaluated all of these. And they picked the very best ones and they numbered them one through nine, mauling one through nine. And eventually they ended up with a total of 24 rootstocks out of this. And we're still growing some of those rootstocks today. Uh, in fact, the- so, uh, so sorry, with the, with the mauling, so this is the English station where they took all these paradise rootstocks, they're all confused. They organized them and they labeled them. Well, how were they then going to propagate them 
so that it could be consistent, so that the modeling nine or M9 is always one kind of thing. H how could they in those days ensure consistency between like in one type of rootstock? Okay, well, what they would do was they would is create a, what's called a stool bed. And they planted those rootstocks out as little trees and uh, they let them grow the first year. Some of them laid them, planted them at an angle and then laid them down and pinned them down on the ground and uh, covered them with a little soil and let those trees grow. And uh, the shoots would come up and then in the fall, they would cut those shoots off down to the original rootstock and they'd have a little rooted shoot. So they had pro clonally propagated that rootstock. So it's identical to the root, root system that they uh, planted. And so then they would graft the cyan variety or the variety that they wanted on this rootstock and they would have a consistent orchard out there. So that's how these rootstocks originated. And of course, England wasn't the only country that uh, looked at rootstocks. Uh, Russia developed the Budagoski stocks, the Bud 9, the uh, Bud 10, B118. Uh, those are some of the more common ones right now. Uh, Germany developed the, the uh, PIAU and supporter rootstocks. Canada developed the Ottawa and the Vinland rootstocks. Poland developed the P rootstocks. The Czech Republic developed JTEH rootstocks. The ne Netherlands has released clones called NAKB rootstocks, particularly a Malling 9 rootstock. France has the Padgham rootstocks. And of course, the United States uh, has used a lot of the rootstocks from all over the world. And uh, Cornell University has developed a series of Geneva rootstocks. And these are some of the hotter or better rootstocks that are being grown in the United States and all over the world right now. Amazing. Uh, such, a, uh, such a wide variety. We've got, oh, we got a question here from okay. Mike. Where's Mike from? I'm not sure. Oh, the subject is 2,000 years. So Mike writes, hello, Susan, 2,000 years. John doesn't sound that old. <laughs> Only kidding. Sometimes I feel like that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, I'll tell you. Yeah. Interesting show today, thanks. So yeah. that was from Mike. Um, okay, so we have this mess of different rootstocks. It's not mess, it's organized. They're all clones. And there's... They all like, what is the difference between all of them? Why was there a need to have so many different rootstocks? Why didn't they just pick three and just everybody stick with those? Well, we're growing these all over the world. And as you would expect, the growing conditions in Canada are not the same as in California or in Florida. So some of these things are much better adapted in certain areas. You know, in Canada, you're looking for cold hardiness. You want the thing to go through the winter. Uh, in Florida, uh, you, the, the warm temperatures down there and all the moisture and things are really tough. It gives you problems with diseases. So uh, most people think with a dwarfing rootstock, you're just looking for dwarfing, but commercial growers and growers are looking for something that'll survive. That's the bottom line and give them a tree the size that they want. Now, one thing that you need to remember about dwarf rootstocks is that tree on a dwarf rootstock is not dwarf until it starts fruiting. So a tree on a dwarf rootstock is gonna grow at the same rate as a tree on a seedling rootstock until you put fruit on the tree. Once you get fruit on that tree, the tree mobilizes its resources with a dwarf tree into producing more fruit. Whereas one of these trees on a seedling rootstock or a Mauling Merton 111 rootstock grows a lot more wood. And if you're a grower, you'd kind of rather grow fruit rather than grow wood because it takes a lot of time to prune these trees and big trees take a lot longer to pick. They're more expensive to maintain. Uh, we've got a lot of pests on apple trees. And so spraying those trees is much more difficult to get that whole tree sprayed when you've got a big tree as opposed to a small tree. And of course, uh -huh. with a small tree, when you're spraying, you get much better coverage of the tree. So you get a higher pack out of number one apples off of a small tree. You don't have as many cull apples. So there's a real push for dwarf apples. Now, part of the problem with dwarf apples is you, uh, there's a little bit of a trade-off, okay? 
uh, when you go to a dwarf tree, uh, that rootstock is more brittle, okay? That tree cracks off at the graft union sometime or the roots are brittle. Uh, some of these newer rootstocks, the roots are like a stiff carrot. You can snap them, okay? So those dwarf trees have to be trellised. Put on a trellis to support them, otherwise they'll snap off uh, with a heavy fruit load and a windstorm. Or they may just snap off with a windstorm. So uh, you've got to Gosh, do some extra yeah. things for these young trees. And so, yeah, so, so I'm seeing that with this huge variety, so we've got, we've got an attempt to make the tree smaller for growers. So that's mm -hmm. great for growers. Handy also for home growers mm -hmm. who don't have room for a very big tree. Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. Uh, and yet, um, is there a downside to having small trees, whether it's in an orchard or, you know, it, it, was it a mistake in some ways to move away from these big, strong, full-size trees? No, th there's a lot of advantage to, to dwarf trees, but you've got to take care of them. If they're planted close, if you've got an orchard that's a dwarf orchard with a thousand trees per acre, that whole area underneath of that orchard is honeycombed with roots. All those trees are competing with each other. You know, I've been doing this a long time and we started out with semi-dwarf trees and, you know, those trees were planted 15 feet apart in the row. And then you start crunching the, the spacing down with, between the trees. Now a tree grown in Canada or Minnesota does not get as big as a tree grown in North Carolina. We've got a lot longer growing season in the South and those trees get bigger. And so uh, you control the size of that tree by the rootstock, but also you gotta prune that thing annually. You don't over fertilize it, okay? And you need to crop that tree consistently. Now, just apple grower says, well, I'm gonna crop it every year, but you get a frost that freezes all your flowers off the tree, or you have real rainy conditions during bloom and the bees aren't out there to pollinate it. So we get years where you don't have much of a crop. So you put that energy into growing the tree and they can get pretty big. So uh, mm. there's a lot involved in keeping that tree size down. Amazing. It's amazing because I really feel that there is this a misconception that you buy a dwarfing tree and no matter what, it will be dwarfing. But if for whatever reason it's not fruiting, it'll just keep growing. Um, that's very interesting. How is it that over time we filtered down to just a handful of apple root stocks that people use again and again and again. Um, and what are some examples of those very common root stocks used? These, we, we, the selecting root stocks is a continuum. We don't have the perfect root stock. We're always looking for something that's better. And for example, when I first started working in Kentucky, we plant mulling nine root stocks. Okay. It's been around for a long time. It's more prone to fire blight. Uh, it doesn't have uh, a lot of disease resistance in a lot of cases. And so uh, we find that uh, Bud 9 was a replacement for Mauling 9. It was much hardier. We occasionally get injury on Mauling 9 rootstock if we had an early fall freeze. Uh, it was much more susceptible to fire blight and it killed the tree. Uh, you don't want to lose your tree. So Bud 9 is more resistant to fire blight, uh, but both of those get Woolly apple aphids, okay? That's a problem in the South more than it is up North. So uh, we're looking, the East Mauling Research Station developed the Mauling Merton 106 and Mauling Merton 111 rootstocks by crossing them with Northern Spy Apple to get woolly apple aphid resistance. But we're, Mauling Merton 111 is just too big for our grow, commercial growers anymore. And Mauling Merton 111, I mean, Mauling Merton 106 has problems with Phytophthora root rot the trees died. So the Geneva program has got really resistant roots, you know, rootstocks that are very resistant to fire blight. They're very resistant to uh, collar rot or Phytophthora root rot. They're resistant to woolly apple aphids. They're resistant to uh, latent viruses. You know, uh, when we're grafting these trees, they're propagated clonally. So you get a virus in that variety you keep propagating it, okay? And we've got some rootstocks that don't hold up under latent viruses. That tree either dies or does very poorly. So you've got to have clean cyanwood to, to do that. It's 
a lot of work cleaning that cyan wood up. And we get viruses in the rootstocks. And so they've cleaned a lot of these rootstocks up for viruses. So it's a constant battle. These are uh, biological systems. They're not static. So we're starting to look at Geneva rootstocks. G41 has replaced a lot of bud nine and, and mauling nine rootstocks in a lot of areas. You know, they're still planting about 5% of the trees that are still going in are on mauling nine rootstock in the United States. But uh, we're getting away from that into some of these Geneva ones. It takes 20 years to evaluate a rootstock to decide whether this is a good one or not. And we want things right now in, in, in our society. And so we're still looking at, uh, looking at better rootstocks. And uh, if, if you've yeah. got... If you've got a really poor soil, you want a little more vigorous root stock. Okay, we've got some apples planted on a strip mine. You need to put a more vigorous root stock out there. If you've got a really fertile, good soil, you want a more dwarfing root stock. Uh, some varieties grow more than others. A golden delicious will produce a bigger tree than a uh, spur type golden delicious. So let's just have a look. We've got an email here from, who's this from? Ron. So Ron writes, your name, John Strang, was on the last year Midwestern tree fruit pest management. Where maybe you spoke at a Midwestern tree fruit pest that, management that, that's talk? A, that's a commercial spray guide for the Midwest fruit growers. I, oh. I retired a few years ago, so my name was on that. There's a new one out that doesn't have my name on it now. It just oh, came out. Okay. But it's the Midwest uh, fruit pest management guide, and it is a spray schedule for commercial growers. Okay, we also have a question here from Glenn. Glenn writes, Susan, when you go to a nursery to buy a fruit tree to plant, is that considered a root stock? Listening to you in Ottawa, Canada. Thank you, Glenn. What an interesting question. So, John. A lot of nurseries don't tell you what root stock you've, you're buying. They say it's a dwarf root stock or a semi dwarf root stock or a seedling root stock. So there's certain nurseries like uh, Cummins Nursery in New York that tells you what root, root stock you're on. Uh, uh, commercial growers are very specific about the root stocks that they want. And a lot of them have to order their trees two years in advance of planting. So it takes a lot of planning to get the right variety and the right root stock put together. A lot of these nurseries don't like to graph things and then find they have to burn the trees because they don't have a sale for it. So a lot of commercial orders are made ahead of time. And something that I've noticed, John, is that in the fruit tree nurseries that I use, they do say, but you have to look at sort of the paragraph when they say apple trees. Our apple trees are grafted onto these root stocks. Mm -hmm. The dwarf trees are on M9, the semi-dwarf are on whatever. And you can always call them up to find out because over the years, for me, I've realized that every rootstock has its own characteristics. Some are even more drought resistant. Some are, uh, you know, there, there are so many different things that are customizable with a fruit tree. And so once you, Glenn, find out what the rootstock is, you can do some research and see if your fruit trees need some extra special care. If, if you get on the internet, or I believe if you look at your website, uh, the uh, Cornell University has uh, published the Geneva apple rootstock comparison chart. And that gives you a comparison of all of these rootstocks. It shows you what size they'll produce, what size trees they'll produce. And it gives you all the characteristics that they're resistant to or not resistant to. So that's a really good place to start with on those root stocks. And uh, I will share that graph with everybody. When, when you want to uh, listen back to this podcast, in the show notes, I'm going to put a link to that Cornell Geneva Apple Rootstocks comparison chart because John sent that to me. It is so useful. I've got two more quick questions. Uh, okay. Here's an interesting one from Mike from Hammond, Ontario. Hi, I have a question for today's show. For a home grower who would like to graft a tree or two, is there a downside, other than not knowing the size, to starting an apple seed to grow as rootstock? Um, I had a few questions from people up in Canada looking at really hardy rootstocks like Antonovka and, and Dolgo. Those are typically seedling rootstocks. They're easy to produce but they're gonna give you a full size standard tree. If you want size control, you need to order 
uh, some of these dwarfing rootstocks. And there's a few nurseries that will sell small bundles of rootstocks. Typically, a commercial bot grower buys rootstock if rootstocks if he's going to graft his trees uh, from a nursery. They sell them in bundles of fifty or a hundred, typically. And most homeowners don't quite want that many rootstocks. We also have a question here from Dawn. Excellent question. Dawn is from uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, Susan and John. What exactly is fire blight? It sounds nasty. Loving you in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, when we're spraying fruit trees, we're spraying for a number of things. We're spraying for insects like coddling moth, oriental fruit moth that puts a worm in the apple. We're spraying for uh, mites, they're little spiders. We're spraying for fungus diseases that are the majority of the disease, diseases like the fruit rots and apple scab, which is a real serious problem up, up north or cedar apple rust, which is more of a problem down south. Fire blight is a bacterial disease and a characteristic of fire blight or a characteristic of bacterial diseases is they multiply really fast. Under ideal conditions in the spring during bloom, uh, you can go from one to a million bacteria overnight. So it literally explodes in the orchard and it kills trees. It hits the tips of the shoots or hits the flower clusters and starts moving into the trees. Typically it builds up on the flowers in the tree. And then roughly about a month later, it starts hitting the young shoots and traveling down these shoots. Now, if you're growing dwarf trees in a tall spindle system where you're pushing them really hard with fertilizer to get them up to the top wire to start fruiting them, uh, they are much more prone to fire blight. So commercial growers will spray with uh, copper or streptomycin. Uh, they spray with uh, streptomycin during bloom. They'll spray with copper during the dormant season uh, uh, to kill the what we call an epiphytic bacteria or the bacteria on the outside of the tree. It's a numbers game to get those numbers down. And then uh, a lot of commercial growers will spray with a light rate of copper during the season for the first year. Now, copper will russet your fruit, so you've got to be real careful with that. Uh, 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 russeting is a potato skin appearance, like a, a Idaho russet potato on the outside of the fruit. Doesn't doesn't hurt the fruit or the flavor, but it makes it look unmarketable. <laughs> and so uh, we don't use that very often, but uh, uh, very light rates of uh, something like cueva will uh, tend not to rust them if you don't spray when the tree is really wet or under slow drying conditions. And, and you know, I'm glad that that question was asked because you can see how beneficial it would be to simply buy a fruit tree grafted onto a fire blight resistant rootstock so that you don't have to worry about those particular sprays and you won't have to worry about that disease. Well, fire blight, the, the rootstock is resistant to fire blight. It does not impart resistance to the top of the tree. The fire blight comes in when you get a sucker that comes up from the rootstock and fire blight hits that and goes down and kills the tree or ruins the efficiency of the tree. So uh, you still got to take care of the top of the tree. And some varieties are more resistant to fire blight than others are. That is so interesting and important to remember um, we've got another question here. This one's from Eric. Eric is from Boulder, Colorado. Hi, Susan. A maybe off-topic question here. Since pesticides are used in commercial apple production, what is the best way to actually wash an apple to eat? Just rinse in water or use something else to wash the fruit? Thank you. Um, the pesticides that are used on fruit trees degrade in the environment. Otherwise, you'd be able to spray in the spring and not worry about it the rest of the season, okay? The tree grows, it gets bigger, and the average consumer wants a perfect looking apple. When you go to the market, you're gonna pick the best looking apple. So there's a lot of culls involved. Uh, we don't like to grow Honeycrisp in Kentucky, but our growers grow it because the market is there. But we only average about 50% marketable Honeycrisp uh, in one season. So, uh, to, if you're going to try to grow apples organically, the best way to do it is to bag those apples. You spray the tree early in the spring till those fruit are about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And then you put a paper bag over it. The Japanese have uh, 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 newspaper type bags that you can put over it, but a regular paper bag, if you cut the 
cut a slit on the side, slide it over the cluster and, and put it on with a, with a little twist them, you'll get a perfect looking fruit at harvest. If you've kept it sprayed, if you trap the insects or diseases in the bag, you won't get a perfect looking fruit. Some of them will blow off in the wind, but with apples, you wanna make sure you take those bags off about a week, couple weeks before harvest, because otherwise a red delicious apple will be white. You need sunshine to color those fruit up. That's another, another advantage of dwarf trees. You get good sunlight exposure on those apples and you get, get good color development, both red and yellow color. I'm going to ask a question, bring a question up that was asked on Facebook that I thought was interesting because we're talking about these rootstocks. Uh, you said that many of them are regional because we all have different climates. So we got this email from Javier in Orlando, Florida. Hello, Susan. I've worked with a variety of apple rootstocks, but the best ones that I have experienced where I live in Orlando, Florida have been the larger size rootstocks of the Geneva series. So these are Geneva 969, Geneva 210, and Geneva 890. M11 and M106 haven't tolerated the long-term effects of the constant summer rains, and they get root rot even when planted in raised beds or containers. So I found that interesting because here you've got somebody in a warmer climate um, using rootstocks that have been developed in cooler climates. Yes, and that's different growing conditions. And Mulling Merton 106 is very highly susceptible to Phytophthora root rot or collar rot. And so uh, we've quit recommending that in Kentucky because of that. Uh, Mulling Merton 111 is tolerant, but what you've got to realize is tolerant is not immune. When we say something is resistant, it means it's less liable to get it, but it's not immune. So these things can still get them under ideal conditions. So uh, testing them out in your local situation helps out a whole lot. And uh, uh, I think he's, he's found something that works very well for him in his location. Now, Florida is not a big apple producing state. You know, uh, if you want to look for rootstocks that do well in the South, uh, uh, Auburn University in, uh, in uh, Alabama uh, has NC140 trials, the North Central Regional Apple Trials, as this is a USDA, uh, usually university uh, cooperative agreement where these rootstocks are tested all over the North America and Canada and the United States. And so that's probably one of the closer ones to him. They also have trials in Georgia, but most of those trials lately have been peaches. So. Uh, you should maybe check with uh, Auburn University and see what they recommend or with this local extension service to see which ones are the best ones that are working for uh, growers in, in his area. That's a great Florida. suggestion. Mm -hmm. Florida has doesn't have a lot of cold winters, and so we have trouble getting the chilling requirement there. So a lot of these apple varieties that we talk about in the north don't get enough chilling. They just don't grow down there. So they have specific varieties that are selected for, for Florida. But you're not going to grow a Red Delicious down there or a, a Harrelson or something like that. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, there is a we've um, let me see here. Just checking to see if there's any other emails for the moment. No. Okay, so let's, after the break, I want to talk to you a little bit about rootstock and cultivar combinations. Do some of them work better than others? I also want to talk about the idea of a pest resistant rootstock and what that even means. Uh, so let, is it okay, John, if we go to the commercials for a few minutes and then we'll dive back into this interview just in a minute or two, is that okay? Certainly, certainly. Wonderful. Okay, lots more to talk about. In the meantime, you are listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and Podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101.com, and I'm Susan Poisner, author of the Fruit Tree Care books, Growing Urban Orchards, and Grow Fruit Trees Fast. And we'll be back right after the break.
Hi, I'm Susan Poisner from OrchardPeople.com. And I'm Steph Roth from Silver Creek Nursery in Ontario. Join us for an interactive online workshop called Fruit Tree Grafting for Anyone. In this workshop, we'll teach you how to add different fruit tree varieties to an existing tree. And we'll teach you how to create a fruit tree from scratch. This workshop includes live teaching, practice exercises, lots of student participation, and professionally filmed high-definition videos. This live workshop starts in February, and the class size is limited, so reserve your spot today. Visit orchardpeople.com slash workshops for more information and to sign up today. We'll see you in class. If you're thinking of planting fruit trees and you're looking for a wide selection of cultivars, consider Wiffle Tree Nursery. Our 62-page full-color catalog includes over 300 varieties of fruit and nut trees, berries, grapes, and other edible perennial plants. Not only that, in our catalog we help you through the selection process with tips and advice about all aspects of growing fruit trees. You can learn about adding nitrogen-fixing plants, rootstock choices, and even about planting a windbreak if you have a windy site. We're a one-stop shop as we sell fruit tree care books, pruning tools, organic sprays, and natural fertilizers. We're located in Alora, Ontario, but we can ship all over Canada. Call us at 519-669-1349 to order your catalog. That's 519-669-1349. Wiffle Tree Nursery. Call us today. If you're listening to this show, you are passionate about fruit trees. But do you care how your trees are grown? Silver Creek Nursery is a family-owned business, and we grow our fruit trees sustainably using only organic inputs. We stock a huge range of cultivars, like Wolf River, an apple tree that produces fruit so large you can make an entire pie with just one apple. We also carry red-fleshed apples, like Pink Pearl, as well as heirloom and disease-resistant varieties of apples, pears, apricots, cherries, and more. We ship our trees across Canada, and we can also supply you with berry canes and edible companion plants to plant near your trees. At Silver Creek Nursery, we grow fruit trees for a sustainable food future. Learn more about us at silvercreeknursery.ca. Welcome back to the Urban Forestry Radio Show with your host, Susan Poisner, right here on Reality Radio 101. To get on board right now, send us an email. Our email address is instudio101 at gmail.com. And now, back to your host of the Urban Forestry Radio Show, Susan Poisner. Hi, everyone. You're listening to the Urban Forestry Radio Show and podcast brought to you by the Fruit Tree Care Training website, orchardpeople.com. This is Reality Radio 101, and I'm your host, Susan Poisner. In the show today, we've been talking about apple tree rootstocks with John Strang, retired extension fruit and vegetable specialist from the University of Kentucky. And in the first part of the show, we talked about what apple tree rootstocks are and how they help us to customize our trees so that these trees will be well adapted to our gardens and orchards. But What's interesting is that not all apple tree rootstocks and apple tree cultivars necessarily play well together. And if you're thinking of grafting a fruit tree one day, that might be important to know. So we're going to explore that and a few other things in just a moment. But first, I would love to hear from you. If you're listening to the show live today, you can enter today's contest. 
just by sending us an email right now to instudio101 at gmail.com. So send your question, send a comment, or just email us to say hi. Be sure to include your first name and where you're writing from. And if we choose you at the end of the show, you might be the winner of today's prize, which is a copy of the book, The Modern Homestead Garden, Growing Self-Sufficiency in Any Size Backyard. It's by Gary Pilarczyk, valued at $24.99. So now back to John. So John, you know, the question is, do all uh, rootstocks and scions or cultivars do they all work together equally well, or are some more finicky than others? Some are more finicky than, than others, but most of them do fairly well. Uh, you can see overgrowth and undergrowth of graft union sometimes, uh, particularly on seedling trees. Sometimes the cyan variety or the variety on top will get larger than the rootstock, and vice versa. You'll see a big bulge right at the graph union where the rootstock is a lot larger than the cyan on top. And then we have incompatibility. Uh, some varieties are just not very compatible with a lot of different rootstocks. Stamen wine sap is one of those. Uh, it has a little trouble hooking up with some rootstocks. So uh, uh, the nurseries know most of this. So uh, there's no one place that you can go to find this information out. It's, it's kind of well known that Honeycrisp doesn't do really well on uh, G41, but uh, a lot of people uh, plant that one. G41 is a really good rootstock. It is just a little bit brittle or highly brittle when the tree is really young from about one to four years old. So you've got to be very, very careful with that one to keep it from snapping off at the graft union. So a uh, stake in that tree and actually trellising it on wire is better than staking it because uh, you can get the wind blowing on that tree that twists it a little bit, and that can pop it off at the graph union. We have a question here from Michael from Alaska. So Michael says, hi, Susan and John. Are you aware of any rootstock trials that are evaluating a zone two or three cold hardy rootstock? In the Anchorage area, Bacata has been the go-to for years, but it's slow to grow for the first few years. Then there's Antonovka, surprisingly, which doesn't, doesn't survive consistently for us. And Ranetka, seedling rootstock, is too inconsistent to rely on. Okay. Uh, one thing we need to talk about is hardiness of these rootstocks. These Geneva rootstocks are selected to be hardy, but most rootstocks uh, get killed between 20 between 13 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So the roots are not as hardy as the top of the tree. And so the portion of the rootstock that's sticking out of the ground is the part that is not as hardy. So in Northern areas where you're covered, the ground is covered with, with snow and you have cold temperatures, that pretty well insulates the root system and keep, helps them survive. We have the most problem with really rapid temperature drops uh, where the tree can't harden the tree. Well, with a tree to survive, to avoid freezing inside the cells that ruptures the cell membranes, that water has to move out through the cell wall and freeze between the cells. And if you don't have time for that water to move out, you're more liable to get damaged. So that's why freezing rate is so important. But mulching around the tree or protecting the lower part of that tree would do a whole lot to get them through the winter. Uh, now, at least in around Kentucky, we don't like to use a lot of mulch around the trees because that's a, a site for voles to uh, overwinter and they eat the bark off of your roots. Uh, maybe they don't survive that far north, I don't know. But uh, uh, mulching will help out a whole lot or keeping the snow piled around the base of the trees will, will do a whole lot. Now, there are really hardy rootstocks. Antonovka is one, uh, Dolgo crab is another one that's a northern rootstock. Uh, I don't think we're growing many apples in zone two. Uh, uh, they, they get into zone three pretty much in Minnesota. In Minnesota, they had to develop, to develop varieties that uh, would be hardy enough to grow in Minnesota. A lot of the varieties like Golden Delicious don't do well up there uh, with the winters. So 
Uh, as far as coming up with a root stock that's really good for zone two, I think he's trying them out and seeing what works. I would call the local extension service and see if they have any better recommendations for hardy root stocks. Yeah, that's a great idea. And also, I'd be very curious to know, um, our, in Canada, our University of Saskatchewan has come up with some fantastic, really cold, hardy cherry trees mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. So they also might be, you might want to check out the University of Saskatchewan website to see if they're developing anything, um, because they've been very creative over the years. Now, talking about Saskatchewan, we got an email here from Doug. Doug writes, um, hi, Susan, great show today. Your guest mentioned root stocks that you need in Canada. Where can I find these? And this is from Doug in Saskatchewan. So Doug, in Canada, it's harder to get your hands on root stock, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And you're a listener to this program. So I'm going to tell you a secret. Okay, everybody, this is a secret. Maple Grove Nursery in um, Nova Scotia, they do sell rootstocks in Canada. And I think on Salt Spring Island, uh, there are a number of nurseries that also may sell rootstocks. So that's a little lead for you. Whether they have the Ontario rootstocks, I don't know. Um, but Doug, get back to us and tell us what you find. John, do you have any suggestions uh, as well? I don't, I, I think there'd be a problem shipping them across the border. I don't know, but uh, you know, the Cornell Geneva program cooperates with uh, British Columbia and the Vineland station up there. And so I'm sure they've got root stocks available in, in Canada from some of the nurseries, some of these Geneva root stocks, and they are selected for hardiness. And, but your best bet, if you're in a really cold hardy area is to check with a local extension service or uh, go to the NC140 Apple Rootstock page. You can search for that and look at the results on the local trials to see what's surviving in, in your area. We have a question here from Dave. So Dave writes, is there any freestanding dwarf rootstocks in Kentucky? Great question, because you were saying how important it is with these dwarfing rootstocks to support them with some sort of stake. Um, so is there such a thing as a dwarf tree that's really strong and can stand on its own, well, one, one trunk? <laughs> no, with, with dwarf rootstocks, uh, some of the dwarfing seems to be associated with a higher proportion of phloem in the tree, and that makes them brittle. Uh, I have a row of trees at the university farm here in Lexington that was uh, on bud nine rootstock and the farm manager never got them trellised. And so I just left them there. And over about uh, 14 years, about 50% of those trees have snapped off at the graft union. So it gives you an idea. Some of them will survive, but you don't want to take that chance. Uh, as the tree size gets larger, you get into trees that will self-support. So Mauling 7 is one that we've used a long time. It, it, uh, it self-supports relatively well, but it leans on uh, heavier clay soil. So uh, it could use a, a stake in that situation. A lot of these Geneva rootstocks that we mentioned before, the G969 and G210 and G890 will self-support pretty well, but they are you know, in the mauling seven size, which is about 65% the size of a standard tree for us in Kentucky. So uh, if you have a tree on, planted on a dwarfing, on a mauling seven rootstock and one on a seedling rootstock, the one on the mauling seven rootstock will be about 65% the size of the tree on the seedling rootstock that gives you an idea. Trees don't quit growing. They keep growing throughout their life. So even a dwarf tree can get pretty large if you don't try to control that. I find that shocking to hear that 50% of these dwarfing uh, trees broke uh, broke off. That's quite shocking. Yeah. When people come to me and they want to plant community orchards in, in public spaces, I will often suggest that they go for semi-dwarf trees. They're just stronger because if a kid starts growing, you know, climbing the tree or if kids are playing soccer and they're kicking around a ball or whatever it is, um, these trees can get damaged really easily. So um, yeah, Dave wrote, up, wrote us back again. So Dave is from Cold Spring, Kentucky. Um, what are your thoughts on making interstem rootstocks to create freestanding dwarfs? 
Wow, this is a great topic. So uh, Doug is uh, Dave is suggesting M111 slash G41 or M111 slash G214. Is this a good idea? So why don't you start off by just telling us a little bit about what an interstem rootstock is? Well, we've used interstem trees for a long time, and that gives you a, a, a strong rootstock underneath that self-supports, and then you put a piece up, a piece up to nine inches long will give you the maximum amount of dwarfing that you get out of that rootstock as an interstem that's out of the ground, and then you've got the cyan variety on top. It's much, it takes two graphs, so it's much more expensive, so you don't see much of those being sold by nurseries anymore. Uh, uh, mauling Merton 111 rootstock with a mauling nine or bud nine inner stem work pretty well. Uh, that gives you dwarfing. You plant that tree so that the soil level is on the mauling nine portion of the tree. So the 111 portion of the rootstock is completely underground. And that gives you a freestanding dwarf tree. I'm a little concerned about G41 because of that brittle graft union. Uh, uh, using that as an inner stem, I'm, I'm afraid it would break at the graft union there without a, without a stake to support it. But uh, some of these other ones should give you very good uh, dwarfing capabilities. Cornell is supposed to release a couple new uh, Geneva rootstocks this year, I've heard. Uh, don't know what they are, but uh, those, those are in the, the it's the future. <laughs> coming. Oh, amazing. Amazing. It's just so wonderful how much work is being done on this. Um, actually, here's a nice uh, email. So we have an email back uh, from Javier. Javier. Okay. I hope I said, because I said Javier before. Okay. <laughs> My poor guy. Anyways, um, Javier writes, uh, hello, Susan. I'm available to chime in about the apple rootstocks and our experience in Florida. Thank you. So yes, we got your email. We're going to go through a couple more, but thank you so much. And sorry for hacking up your name. Oh my gosh, that's embarrassing. Okay, now we've got an email from Ronald. Okay, Ron in Massachusetts. On a young dwarf tree, it was said that you can go for more tree growth early by eliminating early fruiting. For this to happen, is the flowering stage or is the fruit set the point of critical elimination? Very good show. Okay. Do you want to tackle that? Okay. Um, with dwarf, we, we should talk a little bit about rootstocks uh, and apple trees. When you plant an apple seed, the tree that comes up is juvenile. Characteristic of a juvenile tree is it does not flower and a lot of times they have thorns, okay? That tree has to grow and get to a certain size. Several years later, it gets to the intermediate phase where it starts flowering a little bit, and then it gets to the adult phase where it flowers and fruits and doesn't have the thorns. Uh, that's one disadvantage of planting a seed to get a, get a tree because it may take 10 years to get fruit on that tree. So we bypass that by grafting the, the roots and the base of the tree stay juvenile throughout the life of the tree. And so when you graft onto a dwarf rootstock, it is juvenile. You are grafting the adult form on that flowers very quickly. You can get flowers on a tree that's one year old without any problem on these dwarfing rootstocks. They are what we call precocious. They flower very early. Now, when you're doing this, you've gotta be very careful not to fruit that tree too young because you can stunt it. You get a little tree, you, the average homeowner says, I've got fruit, I'm gonna get that apple on the tree and you leave too many fruits on the tree. And you remember we talked a little earlier about when that tree starts getting fruit, it goes into fruit production and it stunts that tree. It's really hard to get them growing again. So if you're growing a dwarf tree, you wanna keep the fruit pulled off or just or not leave very many fruit on the tree until you get that tree up to the height that you want. So with these tall spindle plantings, we wanna get that tree up to nine foot up to the top of the wire before we start fruiting it. Uh, in Kentucky, uh, on a G935 rootstock with uh, uh, Gold Rush on the top, a local commercial grower grew it one year, got it up to the top wire, and the second year he fruited it, maybe eight, 10 apples on the tree the second year. It does not throw that tree into 
does not stunt the tree, but he wanted to get more growth on the tree to get it up so he gets into full production much faster. Uh, with these dwarf trees, the, uh, the other reason for dwarf trees is you can get them into fruit production much more rapidly than a semi-dwarf or uh, a tree on a seedling rootstock. So you get a return on your money much faster. You fill that area up, you're up, you've got that orchard up to full production. You know, if you planted seedling rootstocks on a 30 foot by 30 spacing, like was standard in years ago, it'd take 20 years to get that tree up, that acre up to full production. Now we can be up to full production in uh, six, seven years, typically. Well, my question here, though, is you're saying you want to get the tree to a certain size before you allow it to fruit. Mm -hmm. So if you're getting blossoms on this very young wood, do you pick off the blossoms by hand, for instance, if you're a home grower, or do you wait till the fruit forms and then remove the baby fruit? What uh, is safer? Not, not all of those flowers will bear fruit. So you wait till the, the fruit is about three quarters of an inch in diameter and you pinch it off. You grab the stem and pop the apple off rather than grabbing the fruit and pulling it off so that you don't damage the spur on the tree, the fruiting structure on the okay. tree. Yep. And, uh, you know, uh, my common practice would be I plant an apple tree uh, for the first two years. I just take off all the fruit, just let it get strong. Right. And like you say, your your average home grower, we don't want to wait. We want to taste what this fruit is going to taste like. We can't wait. But what I say to people is, you know, this is a time for the tree to really extend its root system to get strong. Um, and then it will feed you for, you know, decades to come uh -huh. but you know it needs that time for establishing itself for expanding its root systems would you say that's true yes in a semi-dwarf orchard typically it's three to four years to harvest the first fruit with the dwarf wow. trees if you're really pushing them with drip irrigation and fertigation uh, some varieties vigorous varieties you can fruit the second year something like honey crisp or ever crisp that are slower growing trees that make two or three years to get them into production. We have just a few minutes left, but I've got a couple more Facebook comments that I wanted to bring up. One is from Mark from British Columbia. So Mark is enjoys grafting and Mark says, personally, I'm switching from bud nine to M9 since M9 has a terrible problem with burnout. Oh, it also seems to be quite a heavy suckerer, <laughs> if that's a word. I like that. Um, so but comparing bud nine to M9, you mentioned that one is more fire blight resistant. But what is this problem with burnout and suckering? Uh, burnouts are what we call adventitious roots. They're roots forming on the upper surface of the plant, on the trunk and the stems and so forth. And some rootstocks like Mauling Merton 111 are very prone to that. So if you leave much of that out of the ground, you get burr knots on there. They're more prone to getting woolly apple aphids into those and fire blight infections in those. So when we're planting on Mauling Merton 111, we tell you to plant that so that the graft union is two inches above the soil line. So you don't have that sticking out. Burr knots tend to develop under wet rainy conditions and shade. And so uh, mauling bud nine is, and mauling nine are pretty similar as far as ratings for burn, burn knots and suckers coming up from the roots. Neither of them are prone to a lot of that. He may just have a shady or really wet condition or uh, that's promoting the burn knot development. It does rain a lot in British Columbia from what I <laughs> remember being up there. So that may be uh, part of the problem, but uh, uh, I'm not, I, I think it's the environment rather than the rootstock in that case, but uh, bud nine would be, be a much better rootstock to put in because of fire blight resistance. Gotcha. Okay, we've got also a minute for Art's question. Art from Minnesota, or it's comment, I tend to graft more crab apples than bigger apples. I just seem to have more success using Dolga seedlings than Anti, A-N-T-Y. That's, the... that's short for Antonovka, I think. Antonovka, I see. I'm on the edge of a prairie environment with hot summers and often dry periods with cold winters. 
I wonder if these Dolga rootstocks do better in shallow soils, slightly lower pH, and in areas where summer droughts can be frequent. And Tanovka rootstocks need several years to get decent growth. Both of those rootstocks are seedling rootstocks. So you're going to have a lot of variation between trees. You know, everyone's going to be a little bit different. And uh, I don't know what he's referring to as a low pH soil. You know, we want a pH of 6.5, maybe down to six. If you get to six, you want to be putting lime on the soil to bring it up. That's where these apple trees seem to grow the best. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience with Dolgo and Antonovka other than knowing that they're very hardy rootstocks, but he's not getting much dwarfing out of those. Uh, he does get drought resistance, but you know, if you're growing dwarf rootstocks, you want to be able to water, water those trees because uh, they're packed in a little closer and they are more sensitive to the drought stress. Earlier on, we were talking and you mentioned to me before we, we started the live show, about the difference between dwarfing uh, trees and dwarfing rootstocks and full-size rootstocks in terms of watering and in terms of care. And you mentioned that um, dwarfing trees need more attentive care. Why is that? Yeah. Well, when you plant those trees close together, you know, we're planting trees three feet apart and, and 12 feet between rows, uh, that whole orchard underneath it there is honeycomb with roots beneath the ground. And uh, uh, when you run out of water, you're out of water. And when you reach permanent wilting point on the tree, it quits growing, the fruit quit growing, they don't start, they quit sizing. Now, if you've got a tree on a more vigorous rootstock, you know, a semi-dwarf or seedling rootstock, you've got a much larger space to pull water from. You know, uh, soil typically, Roughly for a foot of soil, you can hold an inch of water in. Now that varies between a sandy soil and a clay soil. But if you've got four feet of soil, you can hold more water than if you've got two feet of soil. And you want an area that's well drained because roots don't grow where the, uh, the, the, the soil is saturated with water for long periods of time. So that will limit your, your rooting depth there and what's available to the tree later on. Uh, we should talk a little bit about what's going on underneath the soil because nobody sees that. But if you look at an apple, if uh, you look at a root system on an apple tree, about 70% of those roots are within a foot of the surface of the soil. And then they send sinker roots down deep. They'll go as, little, as low as 39 feet uh, to pull water. So when a tree's pulling water in a drought situation, it's pulling it from the surface of the soil. As it gets drier, it goes down deeper in the soil. So those lower layers in the soil are your reserve moisture for your apple tree. And so uh, uh, it's very important to irrigate them if they're getting, getting dry. And permanent wilting point is uh, the tree is no longer able to survive when you wake up in the morning and those leaves are wilted and they don't perk back up during the, uh, the next night. Okay, well, it's almost time now for us to find out who won today's contest. Uh, before we do the little uh, contest prize ceremony, I just want to say hello to Hank, who wrote to me this month to ask about this month's show. And Jillian wrote to me uh, for last month's episode on foodscaping saying thank you for the show. So thanks everybody who wrote me. To all the show listeners, if you want a shout out during an upcoming show, it would be so fantastic if you could go to Apple Podcasts or to your local podcatcher and post a review for the Urban Forestry Radio Show. If you post a new review, I will be sure to share it on an upcoming show. So now it is time for our contest. And in the studio, we have Gary, who's going to help us find a winner. I am. And John, I put all the names in a little bucket here. I'm going to shake the bucket. You'll be able to hear that. And you tell me when to stop. And then I will pull out a little slip of paper with the names. Okay. Are you ready? Sounds good. Here we go. Stop. <laughs> and stop. Okay. Let me grab one here. And we'll see what we have. 
Okay, Javier, or Javier, I'm sorry, from Orlando, Florida. You're the winner. Yes, yay. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Okay, well, congratulations, Javier. Javier, oh my gosh. So embarrassing when I can't pronounce people's names. And thank you so much, John, for helping us to choose the winner. Um, I'm sure all the other people who sent in emails will be very upset with you right now and disappointed. How do you feel about that, John? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't come here to be popular, uh, did you? Uh, so thank you so much to everybody who listened to the show today. Now I'm going to put up a video version of this podcast on the Orchard People YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So head on over to YouTube, look for Orchard People, and you can see videos uh, of all of our shows or all the recent shows. And this one will be up soon, too. So now I would like to thank you, John, for coming on the show today to chat with us about Apple Rootstocks. I've learned a lot. It's It's been a pleasure. It's 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 nice to talk about fruit trees. Uh, <laughs> get into fruit trees because they enjoy it. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much. So that was John Strang, retired extension fruit and vegetable specialist from the University of Kentucky. And that's all for the show today. If you want to listen to it again or download other episodes, go to orchardpeople.com slash podcasts. And you can learn more about growing fruit trees on orchardpeople.com, where I also have detailed articles and courses on fruit tree care. So that's all for now. I hope you'll join me again next month when we're going to dig into another great topic. I'll see you then.